We're going to continue on with section 3.3 here and talk about springs, inclined planes, and compression members in this video. So this a picture here uh, is interesting because it includes a lot of the different types of forces or forces in different uh, types of scenarios that we've talked about and some more that we're going to talk about. So let's just start up here at point A and between point A and B we see that B here is a pulley. So let's talk about the tension in that pulley. I think we would recognize that there's going to be a tension on that side and a tension on that side and we know now that T1 is equal to T2. In other words it's going to be the same force on both sides of the pulley. And from the pulley's perspective it's going to be pulling away from the pulley like that. Now if we look at knot C we know that that same tension pulls away like this. What we have here on the right is a spring and the spring will also be pulling away from the knot and we know something about the force in a spring. The force in the spring is equal to K times the stretch or KS. Now pulling down from that knot there should be a tension and we'll call that T2. If we look at that little dumbbell or whatever it is, um, it's going to have some weight. So I'm going to put that in a different color so it maybe show up a little bit better. Eh, not really. MG is going to be pulling down. What we have uh, pulling up on that weight is going to be that same T2. And we have contact surfaces. And what we'll discover or know maybe already is that the Anytime you have an inclined plane, there will be a contact force, which we will call the normal force. And there will be a normal force on each side here. And I'll call it N1 and N2. And they are actually in this scenario, they're the same because those angles are the same. If those angles were different, those normal forces would be different. The other thing to just recognize is that and so the normal force is perpendicular to the inclined plane and then with round things like this dumbbell uh, or whatever this little ball is the normal force goes through the CG of the ball. In other words the center of gravity of the ball the normal force would go through that ball. On round, on round things the contact force is the normal force the normal force is perpendicular to the incline. The normal force points through the CG of the round thing. Okay, let's look at uh, a couple pictures from the back of the book just so that you recognize some things. But uh, this is all this is saying is that if you have an incline, an incline plane or uh, an angle here, some theta, the angle that the incline makes with the horizontal is the same as normal makes with vertical. And that's what I've said here. So this will be the normal which is obviously perpendicular to the incline. That will be normal. And then this is vertical which is going to be perpendicular to horizontal. So anyway that angle is going to be the same as that angle. If it is a weight or a box or something sitting on the incline plane get this. so we would have a box that looks like this what we would say is that there's going to be a weight going down, a normal force going this way. So I'll say this is mg and this is normal. And what we're going to say is that the nor that the that the um, the angle that the incline makes with horizontal is the same that normal makes with vertical, which means that this is going to also be angle theta in there. Okay, that'll get us a little bit of a start on some inclined plane analysis. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's a here's an inclined plane problem. It's a box sitting on a on an inclined plane. It has some mass, 100 kilograms. The inclined plane is frictionless. It's being held in a in equilibrium and a stationary configuration, so we're looking for the uh, for the force P here to hold it there. All right, let's uh, let's look at what we've got. If I were to draw a free body diagram like this, it would have a box. Here's the inclined plane. It's got an mg. It's got a normal force. It's got that force pulling up. If I define the axes 
going this way as x and this way as y. That means then this is going to be the angle theta and normal is going to have two components. It's going to have a cosine component this way and a sine component this way. Mg is going to go straight down. The angle or the force P is pulling up like this but if we look back at the top picture again if this is angle 30 here then this is angle 30 which means that this total angle is 60 and so if I go back down here then this is going to be P cosine 60 and P sine 60. Summing all the forces to find out what P is I can sum of the forces in the X is equal to 0 that means negative n sine theta positive p cosine theta, one equation, two unknowns. Then I sum the forces in the y. I got negative mg, positive n cosine theta, and positive p sine theta. Two equations, two unknowns. You can set this one equal to that, plug it into here, and solve for p. And that's pretty straightforward. A better way of doing inclined plane problems, and this is the way I will always do it, or I try to always do it, is if you rotate the axes. And what I mean by that is this is perfectly legal, but you can say that instead of having x and y go this way, you can have x and y go this way. So in other words, I'm going to call this x prime and y prime. And it does make the, the, the force equations just a little bit easier when you rotate the axes. And most, for most inclined plane problems, this is the recommended approach. But again, if this is going to be vertical, mg is going down, I still have a normal force going this way. There's still going to be that angle theta between the normal force and the weight. But if now this is mg, it's going to have two components. It's going to have an mg cosine theta pulling down and an mg sine theta going that way. In other words, there's a, a portion of it is going to be pulling it down the hill. A portion of mg is going to go into the hill. P now just has this one angle 30. Again, because I've rotated the axes 30 degrees, and now I have P cosine 30, P sine 30. And then to find out P, all I have to do is just sum the forces in the x direction, and all I have is mg sine 30 and P cosine 30, and I can solve that for P. A common mistake, or a common misbehavior, I'll say, is to rotate to draw something like this and to rotate gravity uh, and to draw a free body diagram that looks like this where gravity is then going at an angle. Don't do that. This doesn't make sense. This is not reality. Gravity does never, you know, weight does never, never does move at an angle like this. So if you're going to rotate the axes, which I encourage you to do, draw the free body diagram in this orientation, not in that orientation. Okay then, let's do this fundamental problem and uh, it, try to do some analysis here. Uh, it says that this is a block that has a weight or a mass of 5 kilograms that rests on a smooth inclined plane. Smooth means frictionless. So smooth is another name for frictionless. It means uh, no, obviously no friction. What we're looking for is the unstretched length of the spring. So we have two angles we need to consider. There's a 45 degree angle, and then there's an internal angle right here. So I'll call that angle theta. How do I find angle theta? Well, you could see that this is a three, four, five triangle. You might be able to do some analysis with that. This is obviously a right angle right there. Or you can just use the tangent function and say that the tangent of theta is equal to the side opposite over the side adjacent and you can find the angle is equal to 36.9 degrees so that's actually pretty straightforward all right let's uh let's draw a free body diagram and uh, see what we can discover about this problem let's go back to that so let's draw a free body diagram let's draw the weight going straight down mg it's going to be a normal force and there's obviously an angle or an inclined plane. Let's draw now the force due to that spring. The spring is inside the string, if you can get all my consonants there, where this is some angle theta. And it will have a, let's put that as a different color. 
it has a force in this direction and a force in this direction. I'll call that the sine of theta and f cosine theta. This is x prime, y prime. Okay, let's draw the components also of the gravity because this is now angle 45. This is going to be mg cos 45 and this one is mg sine 45. Going back to this, this is normal force. Okay, I think I've got all the parts labeled now. All right, if I want to know something about the force in the spring, or the force in the string, which contains the spring, I can sum the forces in the x prime direction. Sum of the forces in the x prime, I have negative mg for sine 45, positive f cosine, uh, f spring cosine of theta, and I can solve for the force in the spring is equal to 43.5. To find the unstretched length of the spring, I have to know what a spring does or how a spring works. But a spring has the force is going to be k times s or and that can be uh, ks or kx however you refer to it but it's basically the stretch s is equal to the stretch in the string in this st stretch stretch in the spring so I know that the force is equal to 43.5. Going back to the picture, the spring constant is 200 newtons per meter. So I'll go ahead and put that back in there. And I can find out the stretch of the spring is, um, is uh, 0.216 meters. Now the question was, is what is the unstretched length of the spring? In other words, what did it start before it began to stretch? Well, here's our little equation for that. The length of the spring is equal to the unstretched length plus the stretch. I've already solved for the length of the, of the triangle is 0 0.5. The unstretched length is my unknown the stretch in the spring which gives us the force is 0.2168 so the unstretched length is 0.283 so anyway that's how you approach uh, spring problems and uh, let's look at another one on this one I've given you the entire solution so I'm just going to talk you through it walk you through it but what's going on here is uh, this spring set of springs starts with uh, point B flat against the wall so in other words the springs are vertically aligned then I'm going to pull it this way into this configuration so clearly there has been some additional stretch in the spring as it goes out okay so here's our problem it has a stiffness of 500 newtons per meter an unstretched length of 3 meters then we want to determine the force that's required to pull it out there's a displacement here of 1.5 meters. Let's look first at the triangle that is being formed as we pull. Now these are similar triangles. In other words, the one on the bottom is going to be the same as the one on the top, so we can just do one. If I want to know what the length is, I can use Pythagorean theorem, and I know that L squared is equal to 1.5 squared plus 3 squared, and I can solve that for the length as 3.354. The length of the string spring is equal to the unstretched length plus the stretch. It's given in the problem that the unstretched length is 3 meters. If you look at the picture here, this total distance is 6 meters. So that means when it's in the horizontal relaxed position or the least, least well in this position there is no force in the spring that means it is the unstretched length is 3 meters which there is no force to begin with. So if the unstretched length is 3 and the total length is this, the x will be the stretch, the stretch in the spring as we go. Alright, let's look at an angle here. This angle right here is equal to the inverse tan of side opposite over side adjacent, so that's 26.6. And then I can find the stretch in the spring F 
is equal to kx. I've got a 500 Newton. It looks like I put that down wrong. This should be 500 here, not 200, because that's what it says up here. 500 Newtons per meter times the stretch, and I get the force in the spring is equal to 177. Now that's going to be the same force in both springs because it's it's uh, uniform um, on both top and bottom. So now let's draw a free body diagram and find out how much force it actually takes to pull this thing apart. The free body diagram says that I have a force in the spring going this way, a force in the spring going that way, and this is where I'm trying to pull. The sum of the forces in the x direction are equal to negative pulling force minus 2. In other words, this is, this is going to be the, the angle, which is going to be the same as, let me zoom back here. This angle here that we solved for is going to be the same angle as this right here. And I hope that you can see that. But as we move this up just a little bit. So this will be the cosine component and this will be the sine component or this will be the sine component. So some of the forces in the X I got minus F plus 2 force of spring sine theta. I know my theta. I know the force in the spring. Multiply it by 2. I get the force here to pull that out is 158.4 pounds. Well, the last thing I want to do here in this section is talk about compression members. We've talked about strings or chains or ropes are always in tension. You cannot push a rope and there's a good reason for that. But rigid members can be in compression. And I used the same picture in a previous slide. But in this case, if I pull down here, this force will be, the force in this member will be in compression. This one actually will be in tension. And after we play with enough of these things, you'll be able to recognize probably by observation most of the time when things are going to be in tension or compression. But anyway, so I'm going to say by observation, we got some angles and uh, all members cannot be in tension. So I'll, I, if I was in class, I'd give you a demo of compression members. But let's draw the angles that uh, are, uh, are given in the picture here. So this is angle, this is 45 degrees angle there, which makes this, let's draw this angle right there. And if this is 45 degrees here, oh, let me see, here we go. This is what I'm looking for. Inside here, this is 30 degrees. And the reason that's 30 degrees is because this is 30 degrees. If I look at that, and look at that, these are two lines that are crossing each other. And we've done this parallel line business before. But that means that if this is 30 degrees, that one has to be 30 degrees. This whole thing is, 40, uh, is 90 degrees, which tells me that this angle right here is 15 degrees. So again, most of the time you can do a lot of this stuff by observation. Don't have to do any arithmetic. Let's draw a free body diagram of this part or of that spot. So let me move this up just a little bit. Actually I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so I can get it all in. Okay, I'm going to draw a free body diagram of the spot. Come on. This is point A. It's going to have a pulling force of 450 going straight down. I'm going to suggest that there is a pushing force going this way and I'll call that BA and a pulling force going this way of AC. Now the good news is many times if you make a mistake you'll get a negative answer. Neg uh, make a mistake in assumption of the direction of the force. You'll, you'll generally Generally, it'll correct itself because you'll get a negative answer, which you'll know is an is a incorrect answer, if you will. But we'll walk through some examples of that as we go. 
All right, let's draw some components. We're going to use the conventional x, y coordinate system. So in this case, in the y direction, I'm going to say here, I have a BA cos 45. That's going there. And then I'm going to put another component of BA, like this, BA sine 45. Now let's look at AC. I'm going to do this in a different color. I'm going to say that AC has, again this is 15 degrees, so AC then has a component this way, AC cos 15, and a component, uh, I don't know where to put it, I'll put it over here, AC sine 15. Now we, once we get all of the forces listed on our picture, we just sum the forces in the x and the y. So let me just move up here and you can see both of the equations. Sum of the forces in the x. I have negative AC cos 15 and positive BA sine 45. I don't know either of those, but I can find out the relationship. Let's do the y direction. I have negative 450 negative AC sine 15 and positive BA cos 45 and then I have two equations, two unknowns. Using the substitution method I can plug that into here and then I can solve for AC and then plugging that into either one of the other equations I can get BA.